Hello, everyone. Welcome. Um, my name is Stuart DeCue. I'm the program director at the Yale Center for Business and the Environment. And a warm welcome to the 2012-2013 Sabin Sustainable Venture Prize Speaker Series. Uh, the talk will be broadcast uh, for everyone in the audience here on Yale YouTube. So welcome to both our audience here and to the audience online. A uh, little bit about the Sabin Prize. Uh, the Sabin Prize and Speaker Series are organized by the Yale Center for Business and the Environment and sponsored through the generous support of the Andrew Sabin Family Foundation. The Sabin Prize supports students and faculty efforts to start a sustainable for-profit business through cash prizes totaling $25,000. This Venture Prize competition also provides quality feedback from professional judges, extensive mentoring from faculty, and opportunities for participants to meet and pitch their ideas to top venture capitalists and leading industry professionals. Today, in the speaker series, we are quite pleased to welcome Paul Salou, the CEO of Harvest Power, as he shares his personal journey as a serial entrepreneur, environmental entrepreneur, in the renewable organic waste industry for the past 25 years. Paul is the Chief Executive Officer of Harvest Power uh, Canada Limited and of Harvest Power Incorporated. Paul has been a leader in the organics industry for more than 25 years. In 1982, he founded EarthGrow Inc., which grew to be the second largest producer of compost-based lawn and garden products in North America. Paul graduated from Cornell University College of Agricultural and Life Sciences. A little bit about Harvest Power. Harvest Power seeks to create a more sustainable future by helping communities better manage and beneficially reuse their organic waste through production of renewable energy and soils, mulches, and natural fertilizers. Uh, and just as a quick reminder for the audience here, the applications for the Sabin Prize are due on March 22nd, so if you have a team, make sure you submit them. Go to the CBA website, you find it online just by searching for the Yale Center for Business and the Environment. Please join me in welcoming Paul Salou to Yale and to the 2012-2013 Sabin Sustainable Venture Prize Speaker Series. Thank you. Okay, good afternoon. <clears throat> It's great to be here at Yale. Aaron, thank you for the kind invitation and asking me to come down and, and share part of my story. And I'm quite excited um, to be talking to a group of students right now because I think you're about to enter an incredibly interesting world. And it harkens back to when I was in college. I graduated in 1980, making me kind of an old guy here. But imagine what it was like graduating college in 1980 I mean, the United States was clearly the hegemonic superpower like the world had never seen. We were on the verge of 20 years of unbelievable economic growth and uh, under Reagan and then Bush won and then Clinton. And it was just overall from a timing standpoint, it was a great time to graduate and a great time to enter the workforce. And so I think today it's a whole lot different. One of my advisors um, has recently introduced me to, to a concept, and it's called VUCA. And I'm not sure if anybody here is familiar with this acronym, but it stands for Volatility, Uncertainty, Complexity, and Ambiguity. And I look at that, and this came out of military war planning in the late 90s, after we basically defeated the Soviet Union, and we had a very simplistic world. You're either with the United States or you're with the Soviet Union. Well, after we basically defeated, won that battle in effect, we went into a whole totally different world and they came up with this term. And so I think that's the world that graduates today from, from colleges and this is clearly a, you know, one of the leading colleges, universities in the world, that's the world that you're going into. So better be armed for that. And I also think um, around a VUCA world, that is the world of an entrepreneur. If you're starting a company, you have volatility, you have uncertainty, you have complexity, and you have ambiguity. So from my standpoint, it's a world that I've been living in because that's the world of a startup entrepreneur of an early stage company. Now I have a larger company that I'm managing, so there's less of that sort of uh, VUCA in my day to day, but then you have the larger issues to deal with um, on behalf of running a larger organization. So I also wanted to, to talk, and I was struck recently by um, a book I read, and if I can reference a Harvard professor at Yale, please forgive me, but Clay Christensen, he's a leading uh, HBS professor, and he wrote a book, How to Measure One's Life. And he was struck by, as a Rhodes Scholar, as an HBS graduate, he's done a lot of work in innovation, but as he went back to his reunions, 
Five years, everything's great. 10 years, certain people had issues. 20 years, divorce, alienation from their kids, career unhappiness, a subset, not everybody. 30 years, more divorce, more disassociation or disconnection with their children, and certain people were in jail. And so he basically said, and this was out of an HBS and, and Rose Scholar program. So he asked the question, why? Why is this happening? I mean, you graduate from college, you're full of all this great optimism, you're ready to go out in the world, you've got a great education from a world-class university. And what he focused on was the sense of purpose in one's life. That at this stage in your life, it really is important to really think deeply about your purpose, what you want to accomplish, your values, and then try to match that to the, to the greatest degree possible with who you go to work for, whether it's a government, whether it's an NGO, whether it's a corporation. And I think that that is a really important point that I want to leave with everybody here. If there's one nugget out of my talk, I'll leave that as the nugget, because as I look back now, having been in business 30 years, and I, I have a sense of purpose of what I've accomplished in my life, and I think it's directly tied to the decisions I made coming out of college. So with that, we'll get into uh, my journey. So I wanted to make a connection with Yale. And as you can see, I'm playing against this gentleman, Larry Zigarelli. Never seen Larry since. This was a photo taken in 1980 in Ithaca, New York. And as I look at that, I say, geez, what a mismatch. What am I looking to pass it in the low post for? I should be taking him to the basket. But regardless of that, um, I put basketball up there because that was my passion coming out of Cornell. And that's what I wanted to pursue. I wasn't that great a player. And Cornell was not that great a team. But for me, it was always very important that, that what I want to do, I have to be really passionate about that. And I think that's a trait that a lot of entrepreneurial folks have. And in this case, it served me well. I had a couple really good job offers, turned them down, told my parents, I want to play professional basketball. And after having them watch me for four years, and I'm not, I was not any kind of a star player, they had some appropriate questions about whether I'm pursuing the right career. I went to a trial camp in St. Peter's College in Jersey City, three days, three days of three games in a row, and at the end of it, I had a job offer to go play basketball in Argentina. And so typical American, relatively ignorant of the globe, had to go and find out, okay, it's in South America and all that. And two weeks later, I'm flying down to Argentina. And this was really, this was a great adventure. And I was excited about it. Big going away party and I'm going off to play basketball in South America. So got there. Turns out that it's a big step down from certainly Ivy League basketball. I ended up having an apartment to stay, a restaurant to eat in, a couple thousand dollars of spending money a month, so to put it into perspective, the farthest thing imaginable from what you think a, a professional athlete um, today uh, is, is all about. And about three weeks in, we had no trainers, there was no tape, and I had a bad left ankle, blew out my ankle. So there, I'm in the hospital, taking the x-ray, the general manager's talking to the doctor in Spanish, and I was not fluent in Spanish at that time, and in so many words, they said, the guy's got a bad ankle, get rid of him. So I'm fired, terminated, three weeks into my, into my job. And, and that was really, um, it was like, God, what do I do? I was able to network with the other Americans down there, I was able to get on another team. The guy, the American on that team, they had just gotten rid of their American because he couldn't play. And I was able to take that because they did not have to invest a plane ticket to bring someone else down. So again, put this into perspective. So I got, got on with that team. He had three cases of inch and a half Johnson & Johnson athletic tape, learned how to tape my own ankles, and everything worked out great. Finished the season, played for a year in a uh, season in Italy, played for a season in, uh, in Belgium. I was on my way to Australia. And that's where I was going to play next. And you know, I was like on this, this wanderlust. So on my way to, um, to Australia, came home. And my family has a large agribusiness in Lebanon, Connecticut. My brother Mark owns it and runs it now, Pride's Corner Farms. We're one of the largest growers of ornamental horticultural plants on the East Coast. So got with my father. And I was telling him my plans of going to Australia. And he said, well, Paul, there might be an opportunity here. 
and there was a large mushroom farm and they had all this spent mushroom compost that was a huge waste product and it was piling up around eastern Connecticut and they needed a solution. So I was familiar from our nursery of like building great soils to grow plants on. So the idea of composting and taking these organic materials and converting them into something that can grow plants was something that, that I was familiar with. So one thing, one thing led to the other and we basically started Earth Grow. And uh, that's a picture of my younger brother, Tim, and yes, he did have a pair of pants on. <laughs> but we are trying to, trying to, we're early on in this notion of natural organic, and so the, the and, and are also early on in commercial composting. Because ba again, back in the early to mid 80s, composting was not considered a industry, it was not considered a profession. It really was considered like, well, what do you, you know, people didn't un even understand what you're trying to do. So we were part of the first group that really commercialized composting, made it into a business in taking these organic waste products and converting them into great fertilizers and soils and other things to help make plants grow. And from there in Lebanon, about an hour from New Haven, it's actually a fairly agricultural part of Connecticut. There are more chickens in Lebanon, Franklin, and Basra than there are people in the state of Connecticut. So there was this huge chicken manure problem. And that again was a challenge. I looked at that and after we figured out how to turn the mushroom compost into a great product, we tackled chicken manure next and really high in ammonia, really pasty, smells. I mean, it is like the nastiest possible material to work with. So I went on a global search to understand how to process this material. And I came upon a system in Japan where their big crop is rice grown underwater, so therefore they have to have a lot of on-farm composting systems. I saw what I thought would work, but it was very rickety. It was more of an on-farm versus industrial scale. Came back with that concept, went to a manufacturing firm that builds machines, and then we put a lot of process control and built this into an industrial composting system called the IPS Systems, and we started a company called International Process Systems. So that really was an opportunity to, to take this material and turn it. And after 21 days, it would come out looking like literally Starbucks coffee grounds. I mean, just beautiful material. And again, we had more inventory to sell and we were on to, uh, to great things. And then what happened, they had the 1991 ban on the disposal of biosolid sewage sludge in the ocean. This is before your time. At, before 1991, literally all the sewage just went untreated into the ocean. So if you were a coastal community, you didn't have to have necessarily a biosolids removal program. You could just dump it right into the ocean, and that was legal. So at that point, when those regulatory bans kicked in, we had about the only North American or US-based system that was cost-effective and worked. Everything else was these massively complicated systems from Europe. So we started this company, and from roots from chicken manure, right now that's owned by Siemens, and it's in wide-scale operation throughout the world basically converting biosolids into a high quality compost from the origins of starting that up in Lebanon, Connecticut. So um, 16 years building Earth Grow. Um, when we ended up building this technology, which I patented, my father at that time was still in the business. He wanted to get some chips off the table. He was slowing down. We ended up selling that business to Wheeler Brader Waste Management and they subsequently sold it to Siemens. Stayed on with Earth Grow, uh, built it with my brother Tim. And then Scott's came knocking, the big national player, and we ended up selling that company to Scott's in 1998. And I think what I learned during that phase of my career is that entrepreneurial management has a limit. And entrepreneurs are great, you know, from the standpoint of their energy, their passion, you know, their willingness to work all kinds of crazy hours, their commitment for their idea. You know, it's so important to them. But what can happen is that you crowd out the team you become a suffocating presence on the company and you're not able to build a team and manage a company in a more professional way uh, if you're gonna scale a business because an entrepreneur is only one person or you maybe have another entrepreneur as a co-partner. You only can do so much by definition and ultimately if you're gonna scale an organization, you need to build a team. And so I've incorporated that learning into what I'm doing at, at Harvest Power right now. So, what happened, 16 years at EarthGrow, um, some good success, helped pioneer commercial composting in, in the United States and North America. Did not know what I was gonna do next. And one of the things that 
you find out in life when you have these points where all of a sudden you're free. It's, it's a great opportunity. And people will seek you out if they know you've got a track record of doing good work. And that's something I've seen in my career time and again. And so what happened? Um, a, an associate that I had done business with at EarthGrow uh, had recently taken over as CEO of Cinegro. It was a small money losing company based in Houston, Texas. It was doing about 20 million in sales and losing about 5 million a year, and it was public. So it clearly was a, in need of a big turnaround. So this gentleman, Ross Patton, called me and said, Paul, I need help. And so at that point, I started to do some consulting. It led into chief, chief operating officer and president. And what we did with Cinegro is we took all of the biosolids, and there's about 15 or 16,000 publicly owned treatment works in the United States. They generate two materials, clean water for discharge and the solids, called biosolids. And so we basically executed a consolidation strategy and organic growth and built that company to about 350 million, over 60 million of cash flow, and then ultimately it was sold to a big private equity company, and it, it was from that point a big success. Since then, they've had some issues. But what I, what I really you know, learned about that is that I learned the power of anaerobic digestion, which is a centerpiece to what I'm doing now at Harvest Power. And I, I really felt that there was a big platform here at Cinegro. Board of Directors was not ready to pursue it. That's one of the reasons why I left after five years. And I, and I think that that stayed with me, that idea that I developed and wanted to pursue in a larger platform at Cinegro. And, that, and those thinkings and learnings have all been incorporated into what I'm doing now with Harvest Power. But this just shows you know, what happens. And so um, Connecticut, there's not a lot of land to do land application, but throughout the country we land applied, we composted, uh, we actually made pellets and then sold fertilizer pellets with a strong emphasis around, around beneficial reuse of, uh, of the biosolids. So when I, when I left Cinegro, like 2004, 2005, uh, one of the projects I did at my last project at Cinegro was we built an anaerobic digester in Southern California, right? And that was around the time when they had this California energy crisis. Again, just probably before your time, but literally you'd be driving along and the traffic lights would stop. They wouldn't work. I mean, this is California. You don't expect this kind of third world type of um, issues in, in a state like California, but it really was like, wow, there's a real problem here. And so from there, that got me all into the renewable energy uh, space and the importance of that. And then obviously the importance around climate change and developing carbon-free energy. So I got, I got very influenced by a group that had been doing work on that. They approached me, we got together, we formed this company, Environmental Credit Corp. And that was in the day when there was a voluntary market through the Chicago Climate Exchange. And the lack now of federal policy, that pretty much is dead. Now we're, we're riding on AB 32, um, the California cap and trade program, which thank God California is leading on that. But this is all about basically making carbon free energy, bundling the carbon credit, the carbon that is not going in the atmosphere into a metric ton equivalent, and then trading that to a producer of fossil fuel. So you have an offset, right? And if you look at cap and trade and, and, and the success in the 1991 Clean Air Act, cap and trade developing a market was really, I think, proven to be the most successful way of dealing with this. But unfortunately, due to uh, federal policy, that is, this, this company was before its time. But we financed it um, with a, a large investment with a European company. This was before uh, that people have realized now that the federal government is not going to act on, on climate change. Maybe it'll change now under Obama. But so a large, large equity investment came in. I was chairman of that company, put the management team in, and we were really one of the leaders in this space. And, uh, and they got so excited, they said they put a tender offer out for everybody but management. And it was an all or nothing. And even though I was really excited about the company, I said, well, I, I just think at that point I sold my shares. And so sold my shares, a year later, boom. <laughs> it was like almost like the equivalent of the dot com. And, and the lesson on that is that I would have stayed in, but it was something that I just decided to do, and sometimes you get lucky. And I have to put that up, just pure luck. I was in the right place at the right time, fortunately made the right decision. Company is still in business, and I think the California program is keeping the carbon credit 
you know, industry, it's a tiny industry alive right now, and I'm thankful for California's leadership, but long term, I think this is a proven way to, to deal with uh, carbon emissions. So from there, um, I got involved with uh, an aquaculture venture, and I understand Aaron is a, is a, is a fan of aquaculture, and a Cornell professor um, had a very compelling talk about this whole trend here, how wild capture is flat, last source of protein we hunt for. We don't hunt for chickens or turkeys or cows or pigs, but we hunt for fish. Clearly, it's flatlining and maybe even going down, so if you're gonna eat the same amount of that protein, you need aquaculture. The trend line is like, you know, irrefutable. So he had developed a recirculating system to grow tilapia. And so I put a group together, we made the investment, turned out that the lab scale to commercial scale, there were some engineering issues and uh, the professor had not really worked it all out. So uh, jumped in, tried to help out, ran the company, stabilized it, uh, but then it was up next to Ithaca, New York. I live in the Boston area, it was just too much. And so lessons learned on that one is basically make sure when you jump into something, you, you really understand it. Uh, that's my one failure. I stayed on and ran it for one year. I left in, I think in 2006, went subsequently bankrupt in I think 2009, 2010. But it was a great learning experience. And I think the lesson in this one, too, you learn from your failures, I think, better than your successes. And in this recirculating system that we were operating, we basically, you had to take the water out of the tanks where the fish were swimming, get rid of the ammonia and nitrogen, and get rid of the CO2. So we had all of this warm CO2-laden air being exhausted from this facility 52 weeks a year. And I said, that's crazy. I mean, that's like a source of energy, and of course, CO2 is going to help plants grow. So that led me from my next business to start Backyard Farms. And Backyard Farms uh, is, is a, the largest producer of year-round tomatoes on the East Coast. We have 42 acres of state-of-the-art greenhouses in Madison, Maine. And that's a picture of my three partners, Wayne Davis, Ari Vondergiesen, one of the great, really, greenhouse growers in the world and then the mayor, uh, Norman Dean of Madison, Maine. And is anybody here from Maine? Well, Maine is a, Maine is a special state, it really is. And you, know, you remember Maine from the coastline and, and all that's beautiful, but you go north of Augusta and Maine is like Appalachia. It's rural, rural America. So this, this town, led by Norman, had a, had a business gateway park for seven years. They, they met monthly and they were trying to attract industry into their town. They didn't sell one lot. They had like 27 lots in those seven years. We show up and said, we'd like to grow tomatoes, you know, in your town. And the reason why we attracted to Madison, they had their own electric company. So if you look at your electric bill, it's the cost of the electricity and the transmission. And it's about 50-50. So we were able to then work with Madison Electric drive our transmission costs down to a fraction of a penny, and then you're buying electricity. And about a 30 to 40% of Maine's electricity is hydro. So it's a good, clean source of electricity. So we went to Madison, uh, worked a deal out with the town, bought a big farm on the Kennebec River, and built backyard farms. And what we did with our analysis was that we said the minimum size greenhouse to make it cost effective was 25 acres. And we drew inspiration from the greenhouse industry in Holland, which is significant. But you talk to the typical Americans and you say you want to build a 25-acre greenhouse, they think you're crazy. That's just beyond the scale. Why don't you start with one acre? But the idea was we wanted to produce local food, state-of-the-art grow lights, all the things that allow you to grow year-round in the wintertime, and then be a year-round producer of local foods. And that's what we did. So, Again, the modern Dutch Venlo greenhouse, you can see the grow lights on there. Uh, significant electricity, but because we had a very good electricity rate, that's why we attracted and, and that's why we went to Madison. And when you basically put those lights on and it's dark, I mean, literally, you almost have to put sunglasses on. I mean, it's amazing. Those lights are teed to go on what they call the PAR light spectrum, which is the photosynthetic active radiation, four to 700 nanometers and then you could tune in the light spectrum and it would grow as if it was the sun. It was just, it's amazing what grow lights can do. Pollinated everything with bumblebees, and as you can see in the top right, the plants, they were an indeterminate variety, meaning they were a vine 
variety of tomatoes. So every 12 inches, you would have a fruit set. And so what would happen is that you'd pick the low-hanging fruit, and then you'd drop the vine one foot, and then the top of it would grow one foot in that same week, and you'd have a new flower set. So it was about an eight-foot vine, and the most mature ripe tomatoes were at the bottom, and then the flower sets, like in the bottom right here, were at the top. And so it was really a clever design. And so the business proposition is tomatoes that were actually ripened on the vine could be picked and delivered to New England and New York groceries in the same day. And it has been a tremendous success. We've expanded now. It's at 42 acres. I, I ran the company, founded it, ran it as CEO for, up, I think, three years, stayed on the board, and then I left. But it's basically, uh, I think, a very, very successful story. 400 people up in central Maine growing tomatoes and, and making a profit. So this leads me to the, to the present. This leads me to, to what I'm doing now. And it's been great to be able to draw lessons learned, inspiration from everything I've done in my career. And I, I got together with uh, um, a leading you know, VC, uh, my founding investor is Kleiner Perkins. They're, they're an active green tech investor and, and really just a, an unbelievably great group to work with. And from there, um, I had a friend who was one of their, uh, had just joined them as one of their, their green tech partners. And, and this is a lesson learned. This, this gentleman who now is on my board of directors, his name is Amol Deshpande, his father worked with me at Cinegro was one of my best engineers. I relied on him for everything. Became good friends, got to know the family, got to know Amol, influenced him. He ended up going to the Cornell uh, Johnson Business School. He worked with me at Finger Lakes Aquaculture while he was there, then took a job at Cargill Ventures and then was recruited by Kleiner Perkins and is, is their, one of their green tech partners now. So that basically, um, when I went out to see Amol, this was after I left Backyard Farms, and we talked about what's next. And, the majority of what I've done is around the management of organic waste with a focus on the beneficial reuse. And so we drew inspiration on what's, what was going on in Germany and Europe at that time where they built you know, a multi-billion dollar green tech industry around anaerobic digestion. So we knew that the technology was there and we, we knew that there was good separation of green waste out. There's a, about 60% of leaves, grass and brushes recycled in the United States. Still, the balance is, is ending up in a landfill. But in food waste, about 95% ends up in a landfill. So I don't know what Yale does, but we'd love to be able to work with, with your food waste. And so there's some follow-up after my talk. And, uh, but food waste, for the most part, is not separated. It's mixed in with the garbage, and it's disposed of. And if you look at the EPA pie chart, there's about 30 million tons of green waste, leaves, grass, and brush. There's about 30 million tons of food waste. And there's about 15, 20 million tons of wood. So upwards of 80 million tons of organics that for the most part, with food anyway, are ending up in a landfill. And we, 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 we think that is a tremendous opportunity. So we had a focus on maximizing the value. This is a picture of one of our, our sites and uh, get into a little bit more detail about uh, how, we, how we do things. But as part of the, as part of the thinking about why, why we started, why we started uh, harvest power? What was the reason why a new company had to get started in this area? And the way we looked at it, there were three basically intersecting challenges that the harvest power business model addressed. First one is well understood, um, except for members maybe of the Republican Party, uh, is that basically we've got rising CO2, and this is the NOAA's Mauna Loa Observatory, and what I love about the spike tooth, can anybody I'm sure this crowd knows why there's a spike tooth on there. Yeah, photosynthesis. So uh, photosynthesis is, is an unbelievably effective way to obviously remove CO2 out of the atmosphere. So you see when the spring, summer, fall, high rate growth, more sequestering of CO2, and then the inverse of that, less growth and, and less sequestering of CO2. So I think it's irrefutable. We're seeing this. We're seeing the impact on climate change. We need to have carbon-free energy. That's something I believe strongly in, and I wanted to be part, part of that. The other, other issue we have is, is landfills. So you look at landfills, it's still the dominant method of disposal in the United States. Oh, I think over 60% goes to landfills, still. 
We do a lot of recycling, there's composting, but landfills really are the backbone of the waste disposal system right now in the United States. So what we see here, there's a declining number of them. Clearly some of them are bigger, but there's a declining number and they're hard to site. And so they're easy to site if you do long haul transportation, but that means there's transportation costs. So we looked at that trend and we like that as well. Also, we like this trend. There's an increase in disposal fees and tipping fees with landfills, because ultimately, if we're going to have a successful business model, we needed to compete with the existing market structure that's out there right now. So we like the fact that landfill tipping fees are going up. And then lastly, because anaerobic digestion and composting, that's really our technology platform, the nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, micronutrients are still in the residual product. You don't lose them. You don't destroy them. So the great opportunity we saw here, and we have huge operations in California, probably the largest marketer of compost to the ag, ag lands in the Central Valley. And if you see the input cost, fertilizer, NPK, rising petroleum prices, rising mineral prices, and then you see crop prices, there's a disconnect. So the ability to take these organic materials, high organic matter, stabilized organic matter, benefit the soil so you don't need to uh, water as much. You've got that organic matter in there, plus all the benefits of the NPK and micronutrients. We like that trend as well. So those intersecting trends basically was, were incorporated into, into Harvest's business model. And so can you look at Harvest and say, do we have you know, some world beater technology advantage? I would say no. What Harvest has, it has a fundamentally sound business model. And I think that has been lacking in clean tech. And if we had just gone in this current environment of $3 MMBTU natural gas due to fracking, if we had just been a pure play renewable energy company, I probably wouldn't be standing here right now. We might not even be in business. So I think you have to, in, in the environment now, of this renaissance of fossil fuels in the United States and North America, you need to have multiple revenue sources if you're a clean tech company like a Harvest to be sustainable. So for us, organics processing and collection, biogas and producing renewable energy and marketing the end product, the sum total of that revenue gives us a competitive advantage and allows us to attract the organic waste that ordinarily would be going to a landfill. So I can't go to a customer and say, you know, you're, you're, it's all going to landfill. We all know that that's not good, right? Now, here's what it's going to cost you, and if it's more than they're bearing right now, I, I will probably won't get a second meeting. And that's just the reality of the marketplace. So for us, extracting the maximum value out of these organic substrates, these organic wastes, is fundamental to our business and the reason why we've been able to grow. So a little bit on harvest. Uh, actually, this is one of our energy gardens in the upper right. Uh, it's in operation right now. But we're managing now about 2 million tons throughout North America, leaves, grass, brush, also food waste, some manure. We operate 30 facilities. We're at over 100 million in revenue, close to 450, 500 employees. We've got now the energy story is coming on. We're starting up two of our anaerobic digesters right now. The third one will be started up by the end of this year. And we really are building a new model. And if you look at like what we're doing, we're a leader in North America, you compare that to Germany. Do you know how many anaerobic digesters they built last year? Over 1,000. So it just puts it into perspective. We're a leader, but we're gonna, we're gonna demonstrate it, but we're still not even close to approaching the scale of the opportunity here. Germany, I'll get into that. There were some policy reasons, but nevertheless. And I've been able to attract some, some great investors, very grateful for the support that I've been able to attract. And I think the ability to execute on a business model and show that you, know, you can make money on a unique business model is directly tied to being able to attract additional capital as well. So a little, little sideway into, into Germany. I mean, what Germany has done is just nothing short of spectacular. Very much policy driven. Now, we don't have that policy in this country right now. And I've generally found tracking environmental regulations, we are about 10 years behind Northern Europe. You know, so what they start will eventually get there, but it's just unbelievable, right? Over 7,000 biogas, 17 terawatt hours of electricity, energy needs for over 5 million households. 
and one, one thing that I think I, I wanted to stress that most people understand, because when you talk about renewable energy, what do people talk about? Wind and solar. Now, Germany has the number one photovoltaic installed base in the world. They've got the fourth largest wind installed base in the world. And if you add up the energy from organics in Germany, which are both anaerobic digesters and wood chip burning plants, you have to take the energy from wind and solar combined, multiply by three, and you still don't get the energy from organics in Germany. So it's kind of like a little bit of the Rodney danger field. We just don't get the respect of the wind and solar. Now, in addition, you have intermittency issues with wind and solar. Wind has to be blowing, sun has to be shining. I'm sure everyone here is familiar with capacity factor. They're both in the 20s. So that's not really reliable power. If you look at biogas, our facilities are operating 24-7, 365. We have to take them down to do maintenance on the engine gen sets, but our capacity factors are over 95%. So you have base load power. And that is what the utilities really want. Because when you're buying intermittent power like that, they really can't take off the peaker plants and the other parts of their electric grid that really should be replaced, right? So I think Germany is a great great inspiration, I think, is a model, and you just have to look at it, in addition to um, um, the separation of, of all organic programs and the ban from unprocessed organic waste in landfills, they had something called the feed-in tariff. In effect, they socialized the cost, and I know it's a bad term in the United States, but they socialized the cost of renewable energy. They said, listen, if an investor is looking to get a 10% return on their capital, what is the electricity price they need from photovoltaics, from wind, and from biomass? And they, they, they allowed that price to be met, and guess what happened? Capital flowed, a multi-billion dollar industry was created. And so, again, this was a reflection of the German taxpayer because they financed that, but what's happened is that they have built a multi-billion dollar industry with tens of thousands of jobs, and it's an industry that's not going away. So, it's great inspiration. We're not there yet in the United States, but I, I hope at some point we can get there. If we had taken the German model, I mean, our economy is about, from a GDP standpoint, is about four times the size of Germany. From an agricultural standpoint, it's probably eight times the size of Germany. So, I mean, there's a potential here for a multi, multi-billion dollar industry around this in the United States. And here I'm standing up in front of you saying that we're building our third plant, and we're considered the leader. So I just want to put it into perspective. There's a long way to go, but I think that the good news is with the size of our economy and the opportunity that's out there, we will get there. Here's a picture of our high solids anaerobic digestion plant built at our Richmond, British Columbia facility. A lot of communities, they do what they call source separation of organics, so you'll have a green bin so green waste will go in there and food waste will go in there. So it's really, it's not a pumpable substrate. It's really something you need to move with a front end loader. So we have, this facility is, is in operation right now, producing about three megawatts of combined heat and power. And from there, we put it into our tunnels, we percolate, um, extract the organic acids, and then convert that into biogas, and then after, about 15 days in our tunnels, we finish the material with a shorter composting process. So then the end, the end products here are compost and energy. And the inputs are organic waste um, that, that goes into the facility. So this is the largest um, high solids AD facility right now operating in, in North America. Here's a plant that um, we took this um, in the fall. Uh, basically, this, this plant now is finished. This is in biological commissioning right now. Uh, this plant is in, outside of Toronto, in London, Ontario. So the reason why we're a US-based company, but we, we operate well in Canada, and Canada has great policy. I mean, we've been able to get long-term good power purchase agreements. Uh, there's a lot of organic waste, food processing in the Ontario area. And this is a, what they call a low solids anaerobic digestion system. So we're using a technology called complete stirred tank reactor. We take in a variety of strictly food processing waste, similar to the scrapings off your plate. It gets slurried and then gets pumped into this tank. We break down the organics, um, and this plant is about six to six and a half megawatts of combined heat and power. 
And then after 25 days uh, in the digester, we then dewater, and then the solids then are dried with the combined heat and power engine gents that we have into a fertilizer pellet, which we then market. So again, organic waste coming in the front door, and then what comes out is basically about 5,000 tons of fertilizer pellets and energy. And then the, the uh, centrate that comes off the dewatering, we basically uh, have a deal with the town. That goes into the sewer system of the town. They process it and ultimately are responsible for the discharge. And they had capacity at their wastewater treatment plant, so it worked out well. This is, uh, this is our latest plant. Um, this will be operating the end of this year. And all three of our first plants are really different, and they all attract different niches. This one is built at a large theme park in central Florida in the Orlando area. And we're taking all of the organic waste from this theme park and other theme parks as well, which consists of basically source-separated organics, food waste. And then we also are mixing then the thickened waste-activated sludge, otherwise known as biosolids, from their wastewater treatment plant. So that's co-digestion, the biosolids with the food waste. And we're locating right next to the wastewater treatment plant. So what this allows then is that we take in the biosolids, we already take in the food waste, we co-digest, and then from there, um, similar to the London plant, 25 days of, uh, of, of basically retention time in the tanks, and then from there we dewater that uh, centrate, goes back to the front headworks of the wastewater treatment plant, and then that, um, that solids is dried with the combined heat and power engine gen set into a fertilizer pellet, which we market that. So the power that we're generating from the organic waste generated just from the steam park is double the power of the 20 million gallon per day wastewater treatment plant. So wastewater treatment is a really good off taker for us because it's baseload. Wastewater treatment has to run 24 seven, 365. So we're taking all that organic waste and getting, and they're getting double the power, they're buying the power back and that'll be the first true green wastewater treatment plant in North America. So to, to kind, of, kind of summarize, I've gone through like 30 years here in about, I don't know, half an hour or so. Um, um, so just have a few kind of summary slides that, that I wanted to share with everybody. And um, one, one of them is, is around, you know, what are the, the key lessons learned, right? We talked about the, the volatile, uncertain, complex, ambiguous world you're all graduating into. Good luck, right? And carefully think about the purpose and your values and try to match those. And I know we have, a, I think, a fairly socially conscious crowd, but there's nothing wrong with the private sector. I've, I've made a living in the private sector. I've made a good living. And, but one of the things that, that I think has served me well is I've only taken an opportunity that I was absolutely passionate about. I think that's really important. I don't know, some of you might have loans and that might dictate you know, the kind of job you get and the kind of income. But to sacrifice because something you really believe in, it has served me quite well. And if there's one thing I want to leave with you, it's that. A few more slides. My curiosity is, has served me enormously well. And I really urge you to, to, to stay curious. That is like such, such an important trait to have. If you look at like what I've done, everything I've done, I've, is I've been curious about, I've been passionate about, I pursued it. You have lessons learned. It leads you to new opportunities. It's something that is really a hugely important trait. And you know, there's certainly nobody more curious than, than our friend, Mr. Einstein. And also, um, I mean, the notion of mentors. I mean, I was very fortunate. My mentor at an early stage was my father, right? I was very fortunate from that standpoint. He was a really, really important mentor. I have, I've had other mentors throughout my business career. But the importance of having a mentor, somebody who's going to check what you're saying and somebody who you trust, who's going to push back when appropriate, I think is so important. The, the whole idea of improved and increasing self-awareness, and the only way you're going to get that is when you have somebody that knows you well enough and that you trust that they're going to push back at you and force you to think it through carefully. So I think it's not just having a mentor at an early stage in life, although very important, but it's having mentors throughout your career. I think that's really, really important. 
and it's about the team. <clears throat> he's, uh, he's one of my heroes, for sure, Michael Jordan. But as I mentioned, my challenges when I was first starting out, very much of an entrepreneurial manager. I can get it, I can do it, I can do it better than anybody else, what, but then what do I have all these employees for? So you, you take the air out of the room, it's not good. It works well at the startup at the early stage, but now with where I'm at with Harvest, close to 500 employees, I've got a really skilled management team. So how do you want to be treated? Do you want to be micromanaged? Do you want to have somebody else do everything for you? No, you want to be empowered. You want to be able to demonstrate your competency as a professional. And so me as a CEO now, my role is to work through my team. And that's something that as I have grown and as I've learned and increased my self-awareness through mentoring, basically those are hugely important lessons. And so at the end of the day, the only, just look at Michael Jordan, right? He was a phenomenally, probably the greatest individual basketball player ever. But until Scottie Pippen and John Paxson and other guys joined him and he trusted his teammates, that was when he was able to go off and become the Michael Jordan that we know, winning six championships and really going down as one of the greatest, greatest players ever. So ultimately, an individual can't scale. A team can scale. So it depends on your aspirations in a company. And there's roles for the entrepreneurial manager, and that's why they call it the founder problem, right? Because oftentimes the founder can't get out of his own way. I founded and led a bunch of companies. And then you gotta move the founder out of the way. And you gotta, you gotta basically bring in a manager, a manager that, can, that can lead the company through the team. And it's the rare founder, like guys like Steve Jobs, Bill Gates, Larry Ellison, those are geniuses that have been able to sort of transition their career and understand what it's like to be the entrepreneur founder and what it's like to be a CEO of a big, big corporation. This is my last slide. So one of the things I learned in basketball is the sense of competition. I don't know, I'm sure whether, whether you play uh, ultimate Frisbee or, or basketball, it doesn't matter. But I think you're gonna go into a very, very volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous world. I hope you're ready for the fight. And I hope some of the things I've shared here today um, are helpful to you. I wish you the best of luck, and I hope to engage in some conversations here as the, as the day goes on. So thank you very much. Is there time for questions, uh, Aaron? Okay. Hi, thank you so much uh, for talking to us today. I'm Lara Burmeister, and I worked on a project last year. We had the good fortune, Anthony, of also worked on it um, to work with DEEP, the Department of Energy and Environmental Protection, on their waste infrastructure and how to move forward. And we dealt a lot with organics and policy here and how much they actually would really like to push that. Um, and there was a project a few years ago that ultimately didn't come through because of the NIMBY situation, um, where they were, you know, essentially, the community was not willing to have a, a composting site in their you know, in their area, and so now they they have a big campaign trying to switch food waste to food scrap, and trying to change the public perception. What is your feeling when you say like it's kind of a chicken and egg situation? Like, how do you see in the states what your main challenges are of implementing these in states that seem to have policies that are very uh, pro anaerobic digestion, pro composting kind of thing? No, very good question, and a lot of it deals with uh, the NIMBY, not in my backyard, right? And in certain communities, it's banana. Build absolutely nothing anywhere near anybody. And so <laughs> w when you're in the Northeast and you, you're fairly you know, population dense, it's all about finding the right site and having community support. We'll never go into a community and try to bulldoze our way in. It just doesn't work. And so what you need to do is you need to demonstrate that you're a good operator, that you're not going to smell up the community. And that's all very important. One of the great things about anaerobic digestion, it's done in an airtight, gas-tight facility. So those volatile organics are broken down, and then they literally they're combusted through the combined heat and power engine genset. But to say, oh, this works in Germany and all that stuff and everything, we realized that you had to build these and show demonstrated track record of successful operation without creating nuisances in the community, because if you do, you're dead. So that's a really, really important thing. And I think the good news is you can do that. 
but it involves good operation, the right technology, because the policymakers here in Connecticut, Massachusetts, California, other sort of leading progressive states, they get it. So now it's more into implementation mode, and we're part of those discussions, and we'd love to, you know, build, we have significant operations in Connecticut right now and around the Hartford area in Fairfield. So we're looking for, for sites in Connecticut right now, and there's a lot of food waste. So I'm optimistic, but it's not going to be easy. Thank you very much. My name is Pedro Leon. I'm from Mexico City, and I've, I've worked on on the electric utilities uh, efforts to scale up waste to energy there. So I wanted to ask you about Germany. Um, what 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 policies did you see in Germany that drove this scaling up of of of, of these uh, concepts? Was it just the feed-in tariff, or were there uh, other sorts of uh, incentives like uh, on tipping fees? And, and about your, your own customers, from whom you source the organic waste, are they also, are they also regularly customers for uh, energy as well? No, nope, good question. So uh, around Germany, uh, it's all policy. But that policy created a huge economies of scale in an industry. So uh, the market responded. And what Germany did quite clever, they didn't make it on tipping fees, they did it on electricity sales. So they carefully calculated, the policymakers, what does a photovoltaic farm, a wind farm, or a biomass AD facility need in the form of electricity price for you to get a 10% return on capital? They figured that out, and that attracted a huge amount of capital. And so as a result, it, these are all higher cost electricity than burning coal or nuclear or anything like that. So what the German government did is they said, okay, we're going to socialize the cost of building out a renewable energy industry. And it worked. It really worked. And it's very, I mean, this is very controversial in the United States. You mentioned socializing the cost of renewable energy. In our current environment, I just don't think it's going to happen. That's why we're, we're operating in North America. That's why there's higher rates in Canada. And, and we're, we're excited about that. And then around sourcing organic waste and generating energy and sending it back, that's exactly what we're doing with our Central Florida plant. We're getting in that waste shed from that one customer, we're getting all their organic waste and then we're selling it back to them to run their wastewater treatment plant and the excess power to offset their overall power. And we did that in Florida. No rec market, no RPS standard in Florida, and it works. Because really, the tipping fee, the disposal fee, is the revenue that you need to duplicate the feed-in tariff model in Germany. Because in the United States, I mean, we're selling that power for seven cents in Florida. So we needed that revenue in the form of the disposal fees. And collectively, you have enough to get a return on that project. But if it was without the tipping fees and disposal fees coming in, it wouldn't work. So, sorry, so are most of your projects that way, where you sell the power back to the organic In waste? Canada, <clears throat> we're selling to the grid. PC Hydro in Canada, in British Columbia, we're selling to their, their grid. And in, uh, in Ontario, we're selling to Ontario Power Authority. So if you're able to get something from the grid to meet your returns, that's great. Otherwise, you know, you, you can work with a large generator. Um, hi, my name is Jeff Woodward. I'm a second year joint degree student between the School of Management and School of Forestry. Um, thank you so much for talking about team. And I actually wonder if you could talk a little bit more about it, specifically in terms of when you're starting an earlier stage venture, how you approach building a team and what types of things you think about. It, even at a small, small startup, team is hugely important, and it even becomes more important as, the, as an organization matures. And, and I, have a, I have a working philosophy around that. And I think um, if a team is going to be a functional team, right, I think it, there needs to be trust. I mean, that, that is to me the underlying single most important thing. You, you know, devoid of all the issues with politics and all that stuff, you need to just have a trust. And early stage, smaller companies, they can do that well because you're working together so closely. You know, when you have trust, uh, you have the ability to debate things. You need to do that. That is so important. I'm guilty sometimes of getting ahead of steam, and it's like, I'm absolutely right. 
Well, that's, no one is right all the time. So you need to have people that are willing to take you on. And you need to have that kind of constructive conflict. That's hugely important. And, and that's something I've had to work on and encourage with people that work with me. From there, you have that, you have that conflict. Then you, you commit on a direction and everybody buys into it. You've got accountability and you get results. So to me, you know, that is sort of the foundational element about how to build a high functioning team. And from the standpoint of building a senior leadership team, the most important thing is that if you follow what I just said, you will act in a cohesive manner. And then you can build the clarity in your organization and everybody understands what you're trying to do. But it does start from having a cohesive senior leadership team. Great. All right. Thank you very much.